So the, welcome to the Plant Health webinar, the second in our series. This one will be focusing very much on ash dieback. Um, we had a great session last week on human impacts. The recording for that has just gone up on Forest Commission YouTube channel. We're circulating a link for that shortly, and we have two more events to come this month. So there's a yeah, few tips there, but please keep yourselves on mute uh, if you can. So we have uh, three speakers for you today. We're going to start with Ivan Thompson, who's dialing in from Copenhagen, and we'll be talking on the, the management of novel ash dieback in forests with a Danish perspective. We'll then uh, ask Chris Thorison, who is the Woodland Resilience Officer, to give us some thoughts about how to manage our woodlands uh, after ash. And then uh, Chris Gibbard, whose name I realise I have just misspelt, very, very sorry, Chris, um, to uh, see what help the Forest Commission can give with grants and a few thoughts on the regulations um, about that. But hopefully uh, Ivan will be ready to talk. So I've just stopped sharing my screen. And Ivan, just check, I might just need to unmute you. So I'm just having to scroll through. I'm here. Can you hear me? Brilliant. That's fine. Perfect. <clears throat> Over to you. Okay, well, thank you very much for inviting me to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is uh, ash dieback, or as I've tried to call it here, novel ash dieback, in order to distinguish it from the classical ash dieback uh, that's been described from, from Britain uh, many years ago. So, uh, but generally it's just called ash dieback. But I thought I'd introduce this uh, idea of n novel ash dieback instead, so you can, so we can talk about that. But uh, what I want to, to tell you today is some of the experiences we've had some of uh, here in Denmark uh, about some of the studies we've made and some of the uh, hopeful conclusions we've made about, about, this, about this disease. Um, so uh, I'll go through and uh, some of the slides are quite complicated. I'll try and not talk too fast. Uh, I'll try and explain what's going on. Um, if you have any questions or if it's too fast, it's I know it's difficult to pop up and say anything, but still, uh, if there's something that could be most understood or anything, I'm happy to to go back and and explain. So just so we are all on the on the same level here, I would like to um, to show you what is going on with this disease, and uh, so we just so we are all aware what's going on, what it, the disease is caused by. This is a fungal disease. It's called by this, uh, caused by this uh, fungus called Hymnoscyphus fraxineus, terrible name, but, um, or you can call it the ash dieback fungus if you like. It's, uh, it comes originally from Asia, and in Asia it is not a pathogen. It is, can be considered either as an endophyte, which means a, a fungus that lives harmlessly in, in, in uh, leaves or other kind of woody material, and uh, does not activate until the, the, the leaf is dead. Or in some case, some, some uh, studies think that it's a very weak leaf pathogen uh, on the native ash, ashes in Asia. So uh, that's very important to remember. This is, this is a fungus that likes to eat ash leaves. And if you are a, a eater of ash leaves, it's very, very stupid to kill your host because then there won't be any ash leaves. So, so the reason why we have this disease in, um, in, in Europe is not because the, the, the fungus has changed or because it's a pathogen. It is because there's a, been a host shift to ash species, European ash species that do not uh, have any kind of tolerance for this fungus. They do not know how to stop the fungus from growing from the leaves into the shoots and eating the bark uh, in the on the shoots uh, instead. So, um, so uh, if you have a what you could call a resistant tree, well, it's not really resistant, it's, it's more like tolerant. You will still get an infection on the leaves, but these kind of trees, they will prevent the fungus from going from the leaf into the shoots and into the bark and killing those off. So that is what we look for when we hope to find trees 
that will not get sick from this fungus. But, but it's very important to remember that the fungus has not mutated or changed or become a pathogen. It is simply because our trees are not used to this fungus. And what we need to, to, to make happen is to find those trees that can do this. So that is the sort of background. And I'm sure all of you know this already, but I just wanted to, to emphasize that it's, it's important not to consider this as a, as a very bad disease that's, that's come and jumped onto us like that. And this is also, of course, why we could even get it introduced, because it came with plant material that is not that was not sick. It's not because we've imported sick plants. It is simply because those plants that came with the disease were not were not sick. They were OK. OK, uh, I've before I when I've talked in Britain before, I've made this timeline and I've, I've some of you may have seen it before, uh, but I just wanted to Give you an updated version. So, so when you see ash die back uh, in the forest, there's a sort of like uh, it it doesn't happen all at once. The the fungus arrives and uh, establishes itself and becomes common in in some areas. And if you are lucky or if you look for it, you can see some sporadic uh, ash die back, novel ash die back. And then the next step is that the fungus spreads from where it's been established, either by spores coming in from the continent or by plants you introduced. Um, and then it becomes widely spread and, and you can start seeing symptoms, very clear symptoms and very characteristic symptoms on young plants and on st young stands, young trees that are in forest stands. Uh, and also, if you have to happen to have pendulate ash, you also see some very clear symptoms on that. That's a sort of, so that is when you really begin to understand that you have something new going on. Then you get into the sort of the impact stage. That means that you, you see clear problems with your with, with at least the young trees. They start to, to get very sick or they eat, some of them even start to die. And, and you can see that your stands are going to disintegrate, really. And you also start to see impact on older trees, sometimes trees outside the forest as well. And on, on uh, older stands, you can see, OK, here's one tree sick and here's one, another one. And this one has symptoms. And, and this is the sort of phase you're still building up. You're still beginning to realize, oh, uh oh, this is, this is wrong here. And then you get into what I call the management stage. And actually, that's right where you are right now. Last time I came over, you were just at the impact stage. But right, I think right now, most of, of, of England, most of Britain is actually getting into this sort of management stage. And in the early part of this management stage, this is, this is the scary part. This is where you see all the susceptible trees showing really severe symptoms. So it feels like trees are dying left, right and center. You see all these sick trees and they die and they fall over and you think, oh my God, this is going to go completely crazy. And, and this is what happened in Denmark. We saw all these very, very symptomatic trees and they were really sick and they looked really bad and and in you know in, in rare cases you would have whole stands that would that would sort of simply collapse um and and that's that's the really scary place but that you have to remember these are the trees that have absolutely no kind of tolerance for the fungus they get sick really fast and they die and, i mean we can compare it to like covid you know if you are if you're unlucky and you have no and if you have underlying problems with your health, if you stand for, for an ash tree, if you if you stand on, on if you're stressed by your growth growth conditions or other things, you will succumb to this disease, and it looks really really scary. Hi, Ben. Sorry, you've been put on to mute. You just need to unmute yourself. Sorry. So what, what, what was the last thing you heard me say? Uh, it was about sort of 20, 30 seconds ago. OK, so, so what I want you to, to, what I want you to, to know is that you should, not, you should not be scared by this initial stage of very sick trees popping out right, left and center, because those are the ones that are very, very susceptible, the ones that will that have no tolerance at all for the for the for the fungus for the disease. So once they're gone, the rest of the trees there, they have some kind of of, of resistance or tolerance and they it will be much, much slower. So it, I, I think some of the studies I'm going to show you will 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 give this idea as well. OK, so so once you're over this hump of dead trees, a lot of dead trees, 
then the rest of the trees should last much longer. And that's 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 the good news. And and also in this phase that you're in now, this is this is the phase where you will start to see the healthy tree stands out. Those trees that genetically are able to tolerate this fungus, to keep the fungus in the leaves and not letting them into the shoots, they will begin to stand out now. In the beginning, you can a lot of trees will look okay, but they're just slow to getting getting sick. But but as you get into that phase where a lot of trees are dying, a lot of trees are showing symptoms, you will also begin to identify visually the trees that suddenly stand out as okay. We have a bunch of sick trees, and there's one or two or three that look really good. Those are the ones you should look out for. So, to recapitulate, so young ash plants, whether they're self-regenerated or as it's at, to, the, to the to the left of the picture, or they are planted to the left of the right of the picture, they will die fast. It's it's terrible to see. You can have a like a nursery. I have. You see nursery beds with completely healthy ash plants that are one year old, and when you came the next year, 25% of them were already dead. And the next year again, it was another 50% that were dead. So it's 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 really discouraging. Um, that's something you will have to that you have, and I'm sure you are seeing it already uh, as well in, in in Britain. We have an ex a study where we have looked at a at a, at a planted seed orchard. Um, they were selected and planted out because we wanted to uh, have more seed orchards of ash. We had some a few seed orchards and they were very much used and they were genetically very narrow. So we wanted to have more and uh, they were selected and they were planted before we knew anything about ash dieback. And then after the planting, it, it turned out that a lot of them got very sick. They had a lot of, of novel ash dieback here. And you can see, and because it was a seed orchard, um, we had uh, the guy who's standing in front of the one healthy tree, one of the few healthy trees left. He went out every year, almost every year, and counted how many tr how many plants had died. And you can see the you can see the development in mortality that the gra and you can see it goes really really fast. So within ten years, almost eighty percent of these plants had died. And they were all selected for being very nice and very healthy and very good, and they just got killed off like crazy. But there were some that were comp completely healthy. About five, six percent of those plants were, I mean, there were some also that still lived, in, but were very, very sick. But but there were some that were completely healthy. And those five, six percent, they will are now the backbone of the new seed orchard, uh, in um, complemented by by other trees being other trees being selected and put in there. But you can see the very, very rapid, and that is very typical for trees below age of ten years. So oh, management, well, if you want to manage, you there's not very much to do. You will see, like I said, nursery plant showing damage in the second or the third growth season. So don't get fooled by them looking okay in the first growth season. They need to have leaves and then the fungus can get in there and then the year after you will see all the dead shoots. There will be low survival of regeneration of plantings. That's what we've seen up to now. But so that's the bad news. All the ones with all the red Red uh, sentences are bad news, but the blue news the, are the good news is when when we look at what trees in the forest has a lot of progeny, it turns out that healthy trees they seem to pro produce more progeny and even better, the progeny are also healthy. So whatever it is genetically that helps the, the trees tolerate this fungus, it also they pass it on to their progeny and it will be visible for them too. So that's good news. So if you have healthy trees out there, if you can manage to hold on to them, there's the seedlings that they will put out will be will be will be hopefully be healthy healthy and help us regenerate our our forest. Also, uh, we have a tolerant stock becoming available. The the first uh, the nurse we have had that first um, seed seeds being harvested from the new seed orchards. We have been chosen for for this uh, kind of humus tolerance, and uh, we are now. They are now in the nursery and they'll be made into plants. And we will see whether any Danish forest will dare to put them out into the into the and try them out. We have also made control crossings, which we have tested very rigorously uh, in the in the greenhouse. And uh, some of the Danish and Swedish material that we have that has been selected, very, very uh, heavily selected. They have produced progeny, which no matter how we try to get the fungus in there, they will not become necrotic and die. 
So, so we have really, really high hopes for putting out um, trees that will, or plant new, new ash populations that will be, that will not be affected by this disease. So that is the good news, which I hope will cheer you all up considerably. It's cheered us up anyway. So that was the below 10. So now we get to the young stands, which is the, for us, is the stands between 10 and 50. So any, so stands that are still characterized by. You mean, you can't yeah. see that, Yeah. Pardon? Is there a question or a problem? Can you hear me? Can you see me? Yeah, I don't think there's any problem, Ivan, that I'm aware of. I can okay. hear you. Okay, I'll just go. On. So, so leaving aside those young plants up to age 10, which is quite disastrous, the next part is, is also a bit sad. Um, those young stands or young trees that are up to about 40 to 50 years of age, they also get very sick. And the reason for this is because they have thin bark. So not only do they get the ash dye back up in the shoots, and you can see the results here, uh, what they look like. These are forest trees or young, young trees that are really, really heavily infected and all the primary crown can die and more or less all they have are epicomic shoots and they're desperately trying to, to hold on to life. But unfortunately, they also get infected at the base of the tree. They get infected at the, at the stem base. And this, is, that this was not discovered until about 2012 or 13, that actually this fungus not only infects the, the, via the leaves in the shoots, but it also affects, infects the trees directly via bark at the base of the tree, what we call via the lenticels, little openings in the bark. And, and you have to remember the fruit bodies of this fungus, they, they come on the old leaf stalks lying on the, on the forest floor. So that means the, the infection pressure down here at the base of the tree is enormous. It is huge, thousands, hundreds and thousands of spores trying to get in there and they succeed very happily. So you get this and you, it's very obvious when it happens because you can see the brown bark, not the green healthy bark, but the brown bark on the young tree. And even here you get these very, very, uh, characteristic wedge-shaped, uh, wedge-shaped, difficult word, uh, uh, necrotic area on the bark. <clears throat> and here you can see I'm trying to show this problem on a, on a, on a tree that's about 40 years old. You can see all this bark here that is dying from, from, um, from the from the ash dieback fungus. Uh, Ivan, excuse me, interrupting. Yeah. <clears throat> At the bottom of your screen, there is so, there is sometimes text, and oh, because God. of the word Way the teams thing works that it's blocked out by a menu bar so yes, if you'd yes. be kind enough just to tell us what is said when it's the bottom right of the screen and make sure we know what it says there that would be really helpful okay i can maybe i can push this away here yeah i will so maybe that was what so did you so if i just go in here so if i just go up here is that what you had problems with seeing before can you see it now what it says at the bottom of it? Because I can see no, it. No, I mean, if you were able to scroll it up in some way, no, no. can see just underneath that it says shoots, but I can't really see it. It says and base of trees in, and then I can't see anything else after that. So, Rupert, on my screen, I am seeing the next line of text. It said and base of trees. So I think that might be a setting on your screen. You have to, you have to. You have to either remove the thing that is, you can probably on your own screen remove what is covering it up. Yeah, or, I can't see how to remove that that bar, unfortunately. It's a menu okay, bar. Okay, so, so Rupert, you'll just need to put yourself on full screen. But please, if Ivan, if you could continue, yeah. I'll, I'll put something in, in the chat. For, for Thank, you. Thank you. Okay. So here you see the basal lesions uh, um, coming up. And if you cut those sort of trees, you can see here I've, I've sliced across them. You can see the white part is the healthy part and the brown part is the dying part. So you can see not only is the bark dead, but also the wood below is, is actually discolored. And on the left hand, you can see that the, the, the same tree I'm standing with has been cut. And you can see these inside, there are also wedge shaped uh, discolorations. You can see them here going in. And what is important here, uh, this is 
the, 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 the yellow lines on the outside of the yellow lines out here, that is actually the Humanoscuphus fungus, that is actually the ash dieback fungus coming out here. Inside here, where, you, where it looks decayed, that is actually honey fungus coming in, using this dead bark as an entry point to go in and, and start decaying the, the, the tree. So you get you get sort of a double a double infection at the at the base, not just the, the ash dieback fungus, but also the honey fungus coming in afterwards. And eventually, that is what kills the tree. So here you have another, uh, and if you can't see what it says, it's on the left. It says ash die ash bark beetles, which are in the in the, in the Latin. The, Latin name for them, and on the right side you have the honey fungus coming in. You can actually see the fruit bodies of the fungus popping out of this dead bark on the on the poor tree that is being completely killed. So normally for the ash bark beetles, you only get them in trees that have been felled, sort of cut wood and lying on the ground. But in this case, when you have the trees dying from ash dieback at the top, the shoots dying, and the basal area being hit by honey fungus. What I usually say is the tree is dead, they just don't know it. So the ash bark, but the ash bark beetles, they know it, so they come and infect them even while they're still standing up and looking almost alive. And again, if you cut this, this tree here with the fruit bodies, it was cut, and you can see now, you can see there's still the fruit body sitting there. And again, there's like a division here on the right hand side, it is the honey fungus has decayed. But on the left-hand side, it's actually just discolored, it's not decayed, and that is actually the ash dieback fungus, what it has done. It has come in, it has killed the bark, it has entered the, the wood, the xylem, and is actually making discoloration here. So, and this is very, very typical when you cut. Uh, eventually, of course, the honey fungus will take over the whole stem and, uh, and eat everything. But in, in, initially, there is no decay. The, the, the ash dieback fungus does not decay, stems, it only discolors. But the honey fungus is very happy to come in afterwards and, and continue with that. So if you want to think about how to manage those sort of stands, well, you have to real you have to know that this is where you get really fast development of this of this ash dieback, this novel ash dieback. And I'm sure you're seeing that already. Uh, but even so, even with a fast development, there are st stands will still be present. Even 10 years after you have the, you see the start of the very bad phase, you will still have stands there. They maybe look very sick, they maybe have a lot of dead trees or fallen trees, but quite often you can still have a, a, a stand that is still like little forest here. Um, it's also very important to look for the tolerant trees here because they distinguish them out very fast. The ones that look healthy, they you can find them very easily in these young stands and it's very important to keep them, or if you can't keep them because the whole stand get dis disappears, it's very important to take graft material to use for for development of breeding, because they are if they can get if they can tolerate this fungus as a young tree, that means they have very very good genes. Now in Denmark, when people ask, okay, what should we do with these sort of stands? Well, what we usually tell them is you should mix in other tree species. If you're lucky, you've already done it. But when you when you when you establish the stand, uh, if you don't, well, start mixing them in as, soon, as fast as you can. And I do realize that in the UK you have a problem with grey squirrels, will may prevent you from using some of these uh, broadleaves uh, like sycamore or um, alder or poplars because you because you have that horrible beast there. But um, but in Denmark we don't have that yet, so we can we can do this kind of mixture. Um, you might as well cut stands that are severely affected because they won't get any better uh, and start over. Or if you want, you can just turn your back, let it take its course, let them die, fall over, put something new in or let natural regeneration take over. And maybe there will be a few ashes standing after devastation. And those are the ones that can be the future. So. Um, but I know it's, it's, it's difficult. And, and I can tell you the Danish forester that did this, he was not happy. This was a stand, it was about 40 years, 30 to 40 years old. It was just getting to the stage where he could take out the first few um, uh, pieces of wood that can be used and they, got, they all got infected. You can see here on the right, you can see the, the, the hemoscuphus infection here and below you can see the honey fungus getting in there and the whole stand, it was about half an hectare, three quarters of a hectare, it had to be cut down and he was, I didn't. I want to say he cried, but he was not happy. He was not a happy, and and 
honestly, if you have those stands 20 to 40 years of age, it may be your only recourse to do this. Uh, bad part is any tolerant tree that was in there is also lost. And and the other bad, and it, and that also means these stands are the ones that 50 years from now should be giving you your ash timber, and you're losing those stands. So So if you're talking about timber availability it's not now there's lots and lots and lots of ash timber to be to be gotten now but the future ash stands 40 or 50 years from now that is when it's going to really really hurt the timber industry because there will be very little or no ash in a size that can be used for floors or furniture or whatever so so you're you're using your loot costing you money now but even in more in the future you will have this gap of non-existing stands that will timber stands that will be gone another thing is that you will also lose you lose a protected forest type uh, in in a european uh, level uh, ash all the forests are protected forest type in the natura, natura th um, 2000 is setting i'm just going to move because i had getting the sun sticking right in my head okay and uh, and in this case, from this stand you just saw, it was replaced by Sitka spruce. So now there'll be a generation of Sitka spruce. All the flora and fauna that is specifically associated with ash as a, as a tree species letting in a lot of light to the forest ground, that will be lost. So we are having a, a special forest ecotype that will be lost if you if you do this. And uh, and um, that is also a thing that is that is um, upsetting in in many cases because because there aren't. There is usually a very special forest type, a lot of lot of flowers, and and because of the light coming into the forest to the forest floor, so so not only are we losing the timber, but we're also losing the forest type. So that is also something to to be sad about. <clears throat> okay, so this was all the bad news. This was all the horrible stuff, uh, which I'm sorry to depress you with, but uh, I'm sure you you're already seeing this happening to yourself. So let's get on to something good, something some nice news. Okay. Uh, so mature stands. Now here we see a much more varied picture. There is a much more varied disease progression. Yes, you will see trees that look terrible, that die, especially in the initial phase of, of this management phase, because all the, like I said, all the sick trees, they will, they will go out. But you also see quite a lot of trees that just sort of stand there. And yes, they have symptoms. Yes, some years they look really awful, but then other years they come back with a lot of, of new shoots and leaves and everything. And they, it's like, like a, and I, you know, I have had foresters calling me like almost every other or every 30 saying, okay, is ash die back over because my stands look wonderful. You know, this drought we had in 2018, so everybody's saying, oh, ash is so good. I mean, I'm sure all the dry stuff has killed all the, all the, all the, all the ash die back. And I was like, no, I'm sorry, but it will come back again. But, but there is like a, variation like a, a, a and and there will be ups and downs so this is where you can really do something this is where you have a chance of, of getting getting on top of this one thing you will have to know is as soon as ash dieback becomes like a, an impact on these stands you will lose diameter growth in act, actual fact you will lose almost all diameter growth the trees will make spring wood to take up water and that's it there will be no late wood. There will be hardly any diameter growth. They will just stand there. So don't say, okay, I'll just wait till I get to my chosen diameter size, because you may never get there. You can see an example here. This is from a stand where we where we have, um, it was healthy in 2012. So they were, uh, oh, sorry, in 2002, there were no ash die back. We know because it's an experimental stand. And then the trees gradually became became sick, and in two and you can see in two thousand five, the ash dieback really started hitting. Uh, and some of the, some of the trees got very badly hit. That's the green line. They got really really severely hit. They had very very severe symptoms. Uh, all the, the, some of the other trees, they were much better looking. All of them had some kind of symptom. But you can see what happened to the diameter growth. You can see from two thousand until two thousand five, you have very nice specific yearings going it's going very well and then from 2006 to 2011 nothing just tiny 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 yearings and that is what happens to almost every single forest tree that i have looked at at yearings you see this 
severe. And this is because what the tree does, it allocates almost all its resources to redoing the crown. When the crown gets sick, the primary crown gets sick, it's, it puts out all these epicormic shoots. It desperately tries to fight off the fungus. It tries to fight off the honey fungus at the base of the tree. And there is no energy left for secondary wood gro uh, xylem growth. Only the primary initial spring wood to take up water to flush and to work. And there is no growth, no, no, no energy left for anything else. And that is why you lose this diameter growth. So, so, so uh, your trees may survive, they may stand there, they may even look fairly healthy, but they do not grow in, in thickness. So I'm, that's, yeah, that's annoying for some, for a lot of foresters. But, uh, but that is the, that is the case. The other thing that happens is you you do have some like I said you do have some trees that get sick, and here is where I'm going to get into a little bit of, of of something complicated. This is um this is data from a study that we have just uh, uh, not finished, but we have uh, collected all the information. We are actually publishing it uh, uh, very soon, and we have compared some young stands and some old stands. We have looked at crown symptoms, so how much uh, dieback do we have in the crown? We have looked at infections at the base of the tree, so how much humuscufus uh, and honey fungus do we get at the base of the tree? And we have especially looked at mortality. How do the trees die? And does, how does the level of symptom, the level of symptoms you have, how does that uh, correspond with, with, with dying? And, and what this, this uh, figure shows here, all the, 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 the full lines there are the old trees, the trees that are older than 40 years, 40 to 50 years older and older. The, the dotted lines are the young trees, so trees that are younger uh, than 40 years. And then there's different colors. So the red are the trees that at the beginning of the study in 2010, when we began the study, at the beginning of the study, they already had severe symptoms. So the two red lines you can see here, so you can see the young trees, that had severe symptoms when they when they started, they died within six years of the start of them. All of them, every single one of the very sick young trees had died after six years. For the old trees that were very very sick when we started, half of them died. So you can see here that it goes down and goes down and goes down. But still, after ten years, they were still about half of the very sick trees. They were still very sick. They still looked awful, but they were still alive. They still were part of the stand. For, for trees that were affected by the disease, but not very sick, means that less than that about 30%, 30 to 40% of their crowns were, 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 had died back, but not more than, not more than 50%. So the, the very sick trees were the ones that had up to 50 to 80% of their crowns dying. The affected trees were the ones where there were clear symptoms. You could see that they were they were being affected by the disease, but they were not really they were not very sick. You can see the young trees of this case, quite a lot of them died also died. About 70% of the young trees that were fairly affected at the beginning were dead after 10 years. But the older trees, they are up here. Yes, they are still then looking a little bit bad and the last couple of years after we had the bad drought in 2018, yes, there were some that died, but not that many. And then, so you can see here, you can see a really big difference between young trees and old trees. They're actually, they are still fine, most of them. Yeah, there were about 15% that died, but the rest are still going strong and uh, they have some symptoms, but it's not too bad. And then finally, the ones that were completely healthy or almost healthy at the beginning of the study, both young and old, you can see they have done quite well. Yes, there are about, there are some of the old, young trees that have died, but of the older trees, only one or two have died. So you can see, depending on what they start out as, the more healthy they are, the bigger their chances are to survive. The sicker they look, Big, the higher the risk is that they will die. So, so, but even you can see up here, it said 35% of the young trees and 85% of the mature ash trees, they were alive after 10 years. And that's all of them. That's every whole group, no matter whether they were sick or healthy or whatever. So young trees die faster, they die more often, but, and, and very sick old trees, they also die, but slower. 
And and uh, like I said, uh, all the ones that was all the young trees that were severely sick in 2010, they all died. And about half of the ones that of the mature trees that were severely ill, they died. So, but to me, that's still very good. I mean, if you see a very very sick tree, you expect it. Okay, it's going to die tomorrow, or it's going to die next year. Not necessarily. It may actually cling to life longer than you think. And and that is the that is the good part. That is the nice part. Okay. So, uh, so if you compare that, it, it is like the, my argument for why you should be more patient with older stands. So if we are talking about management, about ash older than 450 years old, uh, mortality or the, and your subsequent management, that will depend very much on site factors. So soil moisture, if it's very, very wet and the trees are having problems with, with, uh, with drowning, then it will go really fast. If it's more dry sites, if, it's, uh, if they have really good growth conditions, if, if you are lucky enough not to have honey fungus, which may be the case if, the, if it's, a, not, it's a former agricultural land that you've planted your trees on, um, then even, even young trees may actually survive quite a long time. So, so here you ha really have to differentiate. You have to go out and look at the stand, monitor what's going on before you make a decision. Don't just go out there and start the chainsaw and cut everything down. You will see a slow decline. It will last 10, 20, 30, if you're lucky, 50 years before you see, before the stand dissolves and is no longer useful as a stand. You, like I said, you will see very slow, very fast diameter uh, growth decrease. Um, Epicormix will regenerate the crown. That is a good thing. You should be happy about it. If you see epicormics on the stem, that means you will very, very soon have a tree with no timber value at all because you will have discoloration of the stem and you, and you won't be able to sell ash if you want because most people want to buy ash because it's light. It's a white uh, wood. Um, basal lesions from initially uh, and then from honey fungus, they can be really hard to detect, especially in the beginning. It can be really difficult to see that they have problems. Um, with experience, you can see it, and when it gets bad, you can also see it. But you have to be really aware. You can't just go around choosing what trees to cut by looking in the crowns. You have to look at the base of the tree as well, because if you have this color, uh, infections down there, it will discolor your wood and it will lead to a loss of timber quality. So, so that is very important, and I and I just want to show you a, a couple of pictures of what it looks like. This is from actually from those uh, experimental stands that we followed for ten years. You can because you can you can see how they are marked with with numbers, and th this is after ten years. You can see it's, it's quite clear that there's something wrong down here. So basal necrosis, the bark often will fall off. It'll be you'll see with the white mycelium or the black rhizomorphs underneath, and this means that these trees are discolored up to about here. So they very, very clear discoloration. So you have to look out for that because, and the reason why I say this is because you can have a situation where the, where the tree the crown looks okay because it's set out a lot of new shoots. The tree crown looks healthy, it looks green, and it's still very, very heavily infected at the base. And then you may miss out on taking that tree out to save the timber value if you don't look out. So there's a, it's more difficult to find to, to, than just going out and cutting trees that, that look bad in the crown. You might need to take more than you think when you go out there. If you do not cut them, eventually, and you, and you do have honey fungus, eventually this will happen. It will fall over. The trees that are dying from, and even if they're not dying, they can fall over. And if they're close to roads, there will be a safety risk, so you have to deal with that. I'll get back to that that later, but th th it is what happens. They fall over, so so you have to take care of that. This is the this is also from the study that I was talking about, and this is this is also a bit of a complicated um, uh, 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 figure. But what it means is, the the the, the colors here on on these uh, here, if it's green, it means the crown looks healthy in uh, in 2019. So at the end of the study. If it's red, it means the, the crown looks terrible. If it's here on the graph to the left, where it says none, it means that there were no visible necrotic areas at the base of the stem, up to a lot. And this is dead. These are dead here. So, so this, but if you look at this, it means that even if you have, oh, sorry, even if you have a healthy crown, you can have very, very bad necrotic area, uh, problems here at the base. And these are the trees 
they look healthy, but they should be cut if you want to keep if you want to keep as much timber value as possible. So don't don't be cheated by the fact that the fungus that the crown looks good. It can still be very bad. On the other hand, you can have trees that have no necrotic areas at the base at all, and they can look terrible in the crown. They can look really awful up in the crown. That's the red, the red and the orange here. That means it looks awful in the crown, but they still are okay at the base. And and so you can't just keep trees based on what they look at the crowns. You have to look at the base as well because those basal necrotic areas, and which is what it says at the bottom, which if you can't read it, that those extensional extensive basal bark necrosis they can affect the long-term survival as well as the timber quality. So you have to think about that. Just just to remind you, not just to put your head back and look up in the in the crown, but also remember to look at the base. So that is that. That was an interesting result of of our study that you could have this 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 disconnect. But of course, most of the time you have a combination of very bad crowns and very necrotic. You can see most of these are here. Most of the trees are here. So normally you have a good connection, but not always. So so all of this that we've been going through in Denmark, all of our problems with this ash effect. What has it meant for for um, for ash in Denmark? Well, first of all, I have to say that we do not have as much ash in Denmark as you do in Britain. About 4% of our forests are ash, so it's much, much less than, than what you see. And in the beginning, we did not really see a decrease in ash. I mean, people say, oh, the ashes are dying and, and we are cutting them as mad because they are dead. And, we... and it took a while be before we could see uh, a decrease in the ash area in our forest statistics. This is this is data from uh, from our forest statistics. And um, and uh, the reason why I have two curves is we we when we do our forest statistics, we go out and we take samples, and when we take samples, we we uh, we count the sample trees, and then if there are so many ash, so many percent ash in the stand, then it gets converted into area to how how much how many hectares of ash do we have. And and um, we can we we measure the DBH, and that's like a, you know every tree gets measured, so that's a very clear. Uh, most of the time, the DBH gets measured, and we also estimate the age. Sometimes we know the age because we know when the when the stand was planted because it's in the forest uh, forest uh, uh, knowledge. But sometimes we don't know the age, and if we don't want to take drill out bore cores and count numbers of then then we don't know the age. But in this case, I've included both the known uh, and the unknown age groups. So this is like all the ash trees we've seen converted into ash area. And this is both mixed stands and pure stands and anything that goes. And, and that's why there are two lines, because it's done. And you can see they're quite slightly different. And that's because of the statistical uncertainty of low numbers sometimes. But you can see, even with that, even taking into account that there are some uncertainties, it's very it's a clear trend that after a while, we do see a decrease in the number of ash that they find out in the forest. And it's about significant decline starts around 2012, which means about 10 years after we first saw symptoms. So there's like this lag before it gets bad enough to be visible in your statistics. I don't know if that's encouraging or what. And you have to remember that this decline, you can see about half of the ash area that we had in 2005 when the disease become widespread compared to now, about half of the area has disappeared. And you have to remember, this has not disappeared because the ash trees have died. It has disappeared because the foresters went out there and they cut the ash. So the mortality is harvesting mortality. It is not it is not. It does not mean that half of our the Danish ash trees in the forest died. No, some of them died, but most of them were cut. And uh, you can say, okay, well, that's good. that's easy enough to say, but I can actually prove it. And the proof of this is because we also have a statistic of how much do we harvest in our in our forest. And unfortunately, we don't have ash on its own. We have beech and oak because they are the big ones. And then we have ash and maple and all other kinds of hardwoods. They are all lumped together. But you can see here, this is the harvest statistics that we have. And you can see it's more or less the same for several years. And then suddenly it increases dramatically. And we know from interviews with the foresters that almost all of this increase here is due to ash being cut at a 
enormous rate. So, and if you look at the average for before that they start really started cutting ash, you know, before they really got worried and start began to see really sick trees, they cut about 113,000 cubic meters per year of ash and other hardwoods. And afterwards, they cut about 200 cubic thousand cubic meters per year. And that's still, you can see it's, it's, there was a big lump here after they really got worried about what ash means, but you can see it's still, it's still generally more than the normal or more than the original there. So we do know that the reason why ash is disappearing is because the forests are going, and I'm, I'm not blaming them. Of course they're going out there because they want to take the timber quality out. Or if it's young stands that are the, completely disintegrating, they want to take them out and start new stands so they can begin again and, and get some revenue eventually. So they want, they want to leave them there to stand to die. So, so, so that, is, that is very important to remember that, that, that it's a natural reaction for, from a forester who wants to get something out of his timber and not just leave it around to die. The other interesting thing about this statistics is if you put it together with what we have done in the forest health monitoring. This is, we do forest health monitoring where we look at the defoliation of tree species. And again, because ash is such a minor species, we do not, we have very few trees that we look at, uh, but so the variation is very big and the statistics is, is, a, is can be a bit dodgy here. But it's, I think it's still interesting. If you look at the, if you look at the, the, the blue line, that is the uh, defoliation. So the higher defoliation, the worse it is. Here we have dry summers in the 90s. You can just turn up and here this, it goes. And here we start to get the ash dieback. The first time we saw ash dieback symptoms in our monitoring stand was in 2006. And then it just got worse and worse and worse. And actually this stand that we had actually died. The whole stand died in 2011. There was, yeah, and then we had to take some other trees. But the, if you see, you can see here, it goes up really badly. It gets really, really awful. And then and then it drops again. You think, oh, the ash trees are getting healthier. But no, they're not getting healthier. No, all the sick ash trees are being cut. And if all the sick trees are being removed, of course, the average defoliation, the average crown symptom severeness of the trees remaining will, of course, be less. So so, so it's not, it's not because we have this okay, we have the sickness and then all the trees that are sick but died and all the rest are healthy. No, it's because all the sick trees are removed. And you can see that because you can see here it's the same top in removal. It completely coincides with the decline in, in and then you can see it goes up again and up again. So, so that, is, that is something to remember that you will see this bad stuff happening and then a little bit removed from that, you will see people starting cutting their trees down and and then you will see it looks like the forest gets better because the ones that are that are left behind are the ones that look healthy. So don't don't be don't be fooled by this. It's still bad. And you can see here before we had ash dieback uh, impacting the stands, the average defoliation is 12%. That's below the 30% uh, average. It's, that means that the forest is sick. And afterwards, the average is 31%. We I mean, I mean generally in in average, the ash trees are sick, which is more or less what we see out there as well. Okay, so conclusions here, which is probably hopefully more or less okay with the time. You have to remember that this ash dieback or novel ash dieback, not the old type of ash dieback that you had before, which were for other kinds of reasons, but this new ash dieback caused by this fungus, it is very much a forestry problem. It is bad and it will get worse. Not as fast as you maybe think, but it will gradually get worse. We, we are not seeing the end of, of, of problems here, not, not at all. As I said, mortality, as in disappearing ash, it is not caused because, the, the, it, I mean, some of it will be caused by the trees dying, but most of it is caused by people cutting the trees. So don't use the statistics to say, okay, 50% will be gone in 10 years. The impact in mature stands is usually visible about five to 10 years after the fungus arrives, or at least becomes widespread, and then it will get worse and another five or 10 years later. So you have about 20, 10, 20 years from the arrival till it gets really bad. And so you're gradually getting to that place where, you, where you're seeing bad impact in, in mature stands. And then another three to five years after that is when you begin to see people really going out there and cutting sick trees. 
and hopefully just the sick trees and not the healthy trees or the okay trees. But it's really important to remember, even if you go out and you cut a lot of sick trees, you will still have ash forests out there. There will still be stands. There will still be enough trees to be, feel like a forest. I mean, even the worst stands we've had, when, you, when we go out there, they, they, still look okay. they still look like a stand. They're not gone. They're not disappeared. The only reason stands disappear is because of, of harvesting. And because you are a bit behind us in development, disease development, hopefully your ash stands will last long enough that you can manage to propagate the tolerant ash, either the ones that are already standing out there or the ones that you put in there from the breeding program. We, we are losing stands that have been completely disappeared, like I showed you, because, they, because there was nothing to wait for. I mean, they, at that time, they couldn't wait. They just had to cut them. And you will probably see the same, some of the young stands, that they can't wait for new ash to come in there. But, but it is important that you do not panic, that you do not rush out and cut stands which could have actually lasted 10, 20 years and have kept the forest ecology that is so important for ash forest that will be lost if you remove the stand completely. That if you can just hold on to those ash stands and keep them and then put in those tolerant ash gradually, then you will probably not lose the forest as, a, as, a, as an ecosystem. So, so, so hold on to them. So be patient, but you should also be careful what you do because you, I mean, the sick trees, the ones that look really, really bad in the crowns or they're beginning to have really bad necrosis, get them there. If they're timber trees, just cut them and use them and sell them as you can. Or like I said, if there are long forest, along roads in the forest or in places where there's a lot of public access and, and maybe, I don't know, picnic tables or whatever, you need to cut those trees because they will fall over and they will kill somebody. I mean, we even had forest workers being killed by these sort of trees. And that's another thing. It is very dangerous to cut the trees, ash trees that are dying or dead because there is so much honey fungus decay at the base that they, can, they will fall down any which way. If you have any possibilities of using harvesters to cut these trees, you should do it. And, and don't let the poor forest worker go out there because it will come down unexpectedly. So, so if you have on any chance to use harvesters, do that. And that also goes outside the forest, actually. If you can, just if you have natural ash woodlands, and I'm sure that you, a lot of you have, we don't have that map anymore, we have a very few, but if you have them, just leave them alone. Just turn your back and tell people it's dangerous to go in there because the trees will fall over. Cutting tree, sick tree, it, it does not improve health. It, it visually, it looks better. Your your forest looks healthier, but it's not actual health. It's not sanitizing. You, you can't do that because because healthy trees also get infected by the fungus in in the in the leaves. They just don't get sick. So so leave them alone and hope that they will regenerate and you can put in more stock and you can keep them going. So 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 if it's possible. And another important thing. Do not use your forestry eyes on trees, ash trees outside the forest. If you have landscape ash and urban ash, they are a completely different story. They will be much, much better. And here, aesthetics are, of course, very important. So you should prune the sick tree, prune the sickness away so that it looks okay. And I'll just show you some pictures. Look at this. These are urban ash, and they're not at the beginning. They are at the, they're now. They look like this now. They are healthy because the conditions for infections are very much different and because there is usually no honey fungus. The two very, very important differences. So if you have landscape ash, if you have urban ash, they should be preserved as much as possible. I've shown this example before to some of you. This is the 300 year old ash in a churchyard. They were gonna fell this tree because it had ash die back, back in 2013. They wanted to fell it because the tree was sick. It would never get healthy. Why not fell it? I managed to stop them. They used the money to prune the tree. It looks, it looked fine, and it still looks fine. I just talked to the lady that it, Charles, she said we pruned it again in 2019, and it still looks perfect. There is no problem at all. So it's very important. We saw it in Denmark. We've saw it in Holland, other places. Do not let the forestry panic that is inevitably going happening. Do not let it spill out outside the forest into the into the landscape and urban settings. On the other hand, you do see trees in the urban setting or in the landscape go. Some of you have seen these two trees. 
the one on the left is healthy, the one on the right gets sick, and it, sometimes it gets very sick, like in 2009, or in 2011 they also got sick, and then, and you can see in 2015 it got really, really sick, and then in 2016 it was fine again, I thought, okay, yeah, you, it's coming back, no problem, but what happened is in 2017 it got sick again, and then in 2018 when we had that very dry year, it did not manage to bounce back, it still got sick. And unfortunately, also in 2019, you can see it was, it, it was sick. So that was three years in a row that it was badly looking in the crown. You can see the healthy tree, which is tolerant, does not get any problems at all. And another thing that's important is if you look at here, you, you see the same two trees and the neighbor. This is in 2017 again. You can see the healthy tree is healthy looking. The one in the center is a sick tree that's sick looking. And then the neighbor is okay looking. It also has symptoms, but it's more or less okay looking. This was the first year, every year I looked, this was the first year that we saw basal necrotic area at the base of this tree, which, even though it was outside the forest, actually turned out to be honey fungus getting in there. And um, I mean, obviously it was, it was, first it was the humulus scyphus fungus getting in there and making and killing their bark, and then the honey fungus got in afterwards. And what happened was, here you can see in 2019, the sixth tree is sick, and the neighbor is also sick. And in the winter of 2019-20, the sick tree fell over. It's simple because because the municipality they, they said we will leave the tree standing because it's your it's your photo tree and it's uh, uh, known all over the place as as the the sick tree and the healthy tree. So they didn't cut it down even though it looked very bad, and it simply fell over. And luckily, it didn't hit anybody, which was why quite lucky. And and you can see I have, hopefully you can see I cut out a, a disc and you can see here the decay of honey fungus getting in there. So it fell over. The neighbor, which was also sick, died, never even flushed. And you can see here, it looked like this in 2020. And actually in November, 2020, the dead tree also fell over. I had told the set in Chapazzi, cut it down. So, but until then, so this is, I started photo, taking photos of these pictures in 2007, and until 2017, the, even though the tree got sick, even though it had ash die back, it still fulfilled its role as, as a roadside tree. So the conclusion, when should you fell landscape trees or urban trees or urban ash trees or roadside trees? The conclusion is, if the tree does not regenerate the crown the third year. So one year looking bad, you just ignore that. If it comes back the next year, everything is fine. No problem. If it doesn't come back the next year, so you have two years of, of growth, that's when you start thinking about, okay, this tree may need felling. If you're very, if it's in a very, very problematic spot, or if there are other problems, if it has very bad growth, very little, very narrow root space, or if there are other things, if it has lots of wounds or other problems, then you may consider cutting the tree after two bad years. But otherwise, after the third growth season where there is no improvement of crown look, looks, that's when you cut. And you have to cut because otherwise the tree will probably fall over. So so that's, that's a very, and, and it, 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 it never fails. Never, if you have veteran trees, so very old ash trees, I would never fell them. You can pull up them. You can see here's an example where they've cut very much back on the left hand, it's at the winter photo. The one in the middle, that's the summer photo of the same tree. You can see, okay, it looks a bit strange in the winter with all the cut back and everything, but in the summer it looks fine. It's a nice green tree, no problem. The one on the on the right here is a very old tree that had a lot of ash die back. And then finally, because there's a lot of, of public traffic here, they didn't want to leave all those dead branches, so they cut it back very severely. And you can see three years later, looks fine, no problem. It still looks fine another uh, today. It's, uh, it has symptoms, it has dead twigs, but it doesn't matter, it looks fine. So I would say never, if you at all possible, fell those veteran trees. Pollard them in, let them shoot again, and eventually, even if they die, just leave the dead stem or torso, or whatever you call it, and leave it there for biodiversity, because it's, it's just, it will just stand there and slowly decay. So, so that's, my, that's my advice to you. And I think... That was all, and I hope I haven't put you to sleep or with all of this um, talk. Not at all. That was absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. And I am very jealous. The problems that you're having with sun. I wish I wish we were having those problems. 
<laughs> over here as well. I will, um, I will move to another part where I don't get the sun in my face and you can see me better. <laughs> okay. Um, now, I'm very aware of the time. We do have two other speakers. So although there are a list of questions in the chat, uh, I think I will now move over because I do want to give time to both our other speakers. Um, that's a good so idea. If, I will unshare. That's great. Um, a lot of praise for your talk coming in on the chat there, Ivan. So, yeah, people have obviously uh, really enjoyed that. Um, so, uh, yeah, Chris, sorry if you would. Yeah, brilliant. So, yeah, just on to. OK, John, just trying to. Presentation. Uh, da, 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 da. Right, let's kick this off. Uh, can you hear me? All right. Yeah, coming through yep. loud and clear. Just brilliant. Use, yeah, there we go. Over to you. OK, um, thanks, everyone. Yeah, it'll have to be a very quick run through now. Um, I, I mean, to be honest, I'll make a bit of a confession, um, say that my heart sinks slightly when people ask me what to replace their ash with, because there is no golden bullet to restock. Um, it's a true super tree in the UK context anyway. Native, naturally regenerates, it's squirrel proof, quick growing, good timber, second only to oak in biodiversity terms. I mean, you can even burn it green. Um, but if you bear in mind why we're in some of the tree health problems we're, we've, we've got currently, um, it's usually associated with either pushing trees on the sites that don't suit them or forest stand types. And by that, I mean a monoculture that doesn't suit our climate. Uh, you can hopefully see how this talk and the guidance it mentions might help. But it, it, and it is really silver culture 101, I think. Um, but it'll be a quick run through because we are a bit, bit tight for time. Um, OK, uh, right. The word resilience getting used a lot, um, isn't it? Um, it's a real buzzword. What does it actually mean? This is a quite an old um, definition uh, about ecological resilience, the capacity of a forest to withstand or absorb external pressures and return over time to its pre-disturbance state. Um, obviously, are we going to return to a pre-disturbance state? bearing in mind not just problems with ash dieback, but climate change as well, which is why we need to adapt our woodlands. Um, and the key to, to adaptation is diversity, uh, genetic diversity, species diversity, structural diversity. We, we've just gone down the route of too much um, farming of trees, I guess. Um, there are other aspects of ecosystem health, maintenance of the soil, management of deer and squirrels, management of invasive species and wider biosecurity. But really, it's these two we're interested in genetic and species diversity in this talk. Uh, just to reiterate, obviously, I won't dwell on this exactly as uh, Ivan said, um, ultimate resilience measure for an ash woodland trying to repopulate with a tolerant strain. Um, and it was really interesting to note in Ivan's talk that tolerant ash tends to produce more progeny and healthier progeny. But um, obviously, if you indiscriminately remove all ash, you won't get any uh, regeneration. Um, but we have to be realistic and assume that most sites will lose some, maybe even most, if not all, of their ash. It does provide an opportunity to do two things. First, to bring some very undermanaged woodlands back into management. I think you could say necessity is the mother of harvesting. Second, to diversify what in a lot of instances are very uniform plantations. Um, a lot of what you could call pioneer crops. I mean, ash is a pioneer species, isn't it? Really, if you um, if you create a space, you're either going to get it filling up with ash or birch um, or older, you know, those kind of species. You must think about what your objectives for your woodland are, though. First of all, that's probably the main thing. Biodiversity, timber, landscape. So there's various bits of guidance on restocking. This one is our general practice guide. Um, it's the one to have discussions with your woodland officer around your restocking proposals. Um, there's a surprising amount of flexibility inherent in this doc, but you do need to read the whole thing. There's quite a lot in the intro. Um, you, you know, if your ash is a pristine ancient woodland, don't expect to be allowed to plant Sitka spruce back on it, um, but it, it, it depends on the site and the features on the on the site. As I said earlier, ash second really only to oak in terms of ecological importance. Um, 
and therefore biodiversity should feature as an objective on all sites. Um, a large amount of research has been done on, on mitigating the, the ecological Im uh, impacts of, of ash dieback. Um, this one's a research note. Uh, really worth having a read of that. Um, gives you, you know, suitable alternative species down to least suitable. But um, don't don't forget some of these least suitable may just have had less research on them. So it's not totally cut and dried. Um, but you have to make sure your replacement species will thrive on the site. And therefore, we, we return to our, our old friend ESC, um, Ecological Site Classification Decision Support Tool, freely available on the web. It has its limitations. In particular, do not rely uh, on default soils data. But it is, it's really useful um, to ensure site adapted species are chosen both now and under future climate scenarios. Um, um, we've produced an operations note 046B, restocking woodland following loss of ash due to ash dieback. Uh, it's got some good general advice on restocking, some advice on using ESC, and there are very good online tutorials. Um, quite long, but really worth watching. Key with ESC is you need to input accurate soils data. I can't say it enough. Get out, dig soils pits, um, get uh, become an expert on vegetation classification as well, because that's really useful. Um, and there's lots of guidance out there telling you what species to plant. They don't always make the point that you need to make sure the tree is going to thrive in the climate on the site. Key is the species must be suited to the site at, and the future climate. Um, we like to use MVC types. Um, I'll quickly run through the main MVC types uh, that contain ash. Uh, your woodland might not fit perfectly with these. You can still use them to think about what the likely soil types might be. These are slightly more upland ones. You've got W9 upland mixed ash wood, that's ash woods. That's the sort of thing you get like Derbyshire, Peak District. That could well be um, the Peak District there. W7 ash, older wet woodland, fairly ubiquitous everywhere. Um, W12 beach dogs mercury woodland. Um, this is calcareous, uh, calcareous woodlands. A um, lot of these uh, 87 windblow storm type affected woodlands up on the South Downs, Chilterns, places like that, in filled with ash. As we said, it's a pioneer species. If you, if you give it a hole, it will fill it. Um, W8, lowland mixed ash, dogs, mercury woodland, again, very ubiquitous throughout the UK where it occurs. Um, and then you get these transitional woodlands where, uh, you know, woodland's been felled. You've got you've got maybe conifers growing, etc. Um, the one missing is W10, lowland mixed deciduous woodland, usually oak dominated, but um, with management to remove oak uh, where it's been the most valuable timber, occasionally they they really can be more or less pure ash as well. Hopefully you're still with me on the MVC thing. In terms of assessing your soils and the MVC type, uh, online you can find this grid. And ESC is based on this grid, basically soil nutrient regime and soil moisture regime. Um, it's, the, it's the basis of the FC soil classification system. They're, they're, get the field guide. Um, I think it's field guide number 17, um, identification of soils. Uh, it's brilliant field guide, waterproof, everything else. But this is just a bit of a map to summarise where the types sit. Um, so you've got W12, you know, it's fairly rich soils, moist, well, fresh to, to slightly dry. Um, W10, W8, they're between medium and, rich, and very rich, um, moist to, to slightly dry again. W6 older, well, it's obviously going to be very moist and very rich. Um, and in between W9 mixed broadleaves with dog mer dog's mercury. Now, from there, you might better work out replacement species. Um, this graph is in operations note uh, 046B. We've taken um, typical examples for those MVC types and ran them through ESC. 
The data is from ESC, but uh, you can't produce this graph in ESC yet. We're, we're, we're hopefully we can, we're working on that. Um, along the bottom is the different baseline climate projections. Uh, baseline 2050, 2080. Um, and on uh, species on the left, MVC types on the top. Uh, remember with ESC, you have to select one soil type. Um, so for example, W12 has a lot of red symbols and that's because we selected a, a fairly thin soil type on there. You might have a much deeper soil type and that will affect, you know, a lot of those would be green. Um, obviously green being much more suitable, red being much less suitable. Um, and note also a couple of things. Hornbeam always turns up as a great tree more or less everywhere. Um, it, and, and also note W9 under climate change, it actually gets a lot better because it just gets a lot warmer and a lot drier. Um, sycamore and wild service are also good ones, um, seem to turn up a lot. Um, yeah, and uh, as I say, climate change, it's not, it's not, it's not all doom and gloom. Um, a soil and or vegetation assessment should be done for each site. You can't, um, yeah, can't reiterate that enough. And a specific ESC analysis should then be carried out using this data. Um, now that, that'll give you species to plant. Um, the other thing about NVC is it, it um, neatly encapsulates this idea of mosaics. Um, you know, uh, our climate, we're a temperate um, maritime climate. We probably shouldn't really have monocultures, except occasionally certain areas you will get um, pioneer species coming in. Um, but monocultures are really for, for northern tundra type areas. Unlikely we'd have intimate mixtures either. That's more your um, semi-tropical, tropical rainforest. What Oliver Rackham would say is we have mosaics. Um, and these pretty much are what MVC types are. Small groups of single species suited to a particular soil type. Um, we've got a very varied microgeography because of um, various ice age um, incursions. But these aren't monocultures. Uh, I think, you know, we've got to get away from monocultures really. That'd be a takeaway point, I think. And you can see these design prescriptions. This is from creating new native woodland bulletin, I, I think. Um, Dominant trees for a soil type still likely to be the most prevalent. So this is W8, the example. Major recommended trees, ash, peduncular oak, sessile oak, witch elm, field maple. And you've got all the minor ones as well. So still reasonably have a good proportion of oak in there or whatever. Um, but do have some of these minor species as well. Yeah, the Western Atlantic oak woods is a prime example. Still predominantly oak, varying amounts of non-commercial species mixed in. And that's the species we love to eradicate, of course, over the last thousand years or so. Um, quick mention on provenance. Uh, not much being done since this bulletin uh, in the 70s. Um, recent new report, genetic considerations for provenance choice of native trees under climate change in England. Um, pulls together all the research that has been done and it assesses it in relation to climate change. Um, just go through some of the findings very quickly. Effect of site is usually bigger than effect of provenance. Um, so your site determines what grows there. That's what we keep on saying. But within that, genetic variation within a population is usually bigger than between populations. Um, so what that, what that means is basically natural regeneration is the best way if you want um, wide genetic resource. Again, we keep on saying, you know, keep your tolerant trees so they can they can produce um, seedlings, a wide genetic resource for those seedlings. If you're planting, then it's it's slightly different, you know, because well, natural regeneration doesn't always work, and you might not have the right species there in the first place. If you're planting, northerly provenance can be hardier, southerly often faster growing. Um, different species do show different patterns on that. But southerly is a valid choice for increased production, especially with frost hardy species. Um, yeah, natural regeneration, powerful driving force for adaptation. What does that mean? Um, 
right tree species in the right place is still the priority. Um, but use a portfolio sort of risk based approach is what we recommend. Um, what that means is some natural regeneration, some local provenance, including improved stock, and maybe some southerly provenance. This um, this uh, diagram has been around for a long time, but it's still utterly valid. This, uh, you know, anywhere between two to five degrees south is, is where you could logically assume you, you could grow uh, stock from the Loire Valley in, in the New Forest, no problem at all. Um, and particularly oak, you know, it's, uh, why not? W would I plant 100% oak from the Loire Valley? No, of course I wouldn't. I, but a third, um, there's some excellent trial plots where they've grown really well. Um, frost is a problem. Just to mention, we have got another tool as well. I'll try and put these links in the chat. This is the climate matching tool, and it will match your site to areas that have your future climate. So you can select the future climate, um, you know, 2050, and you can see which, which areas currently in Europe and the Pacific Northwest of America have your climate. Uh, it's a great one for just visually seeing how climate change might might progress in your area. So well worth having a look at that. Okay, and that's a real quick run through and I'm really sorry about that, but I think Ivan's talk was um, much more important really. Key points, cultivate natural regeneration from potentially tolerant ash um, and other species as well. Maintain or increase species diversity. You know, use this as a chance to get some different species in your woodland, maybe even honorary natives, maybe even exotics, you know, on the right site. Look to achieve mixtures and mosaics of site adapted species and provenances. Ensure whatever you plant is capable of handling drier and warmer conditions. Um, beach is one I'm really interested in that does not seem to like warm temperatures. Uh, and manage and protect from deer and squirrels. I think that's it, John. I'm sorry it's a real quick run through, everyone. No, that's absolutely brilliant, Chris. Thank you. That's given people a lot of ideas um, about, yeah, potential replacements for ash, the right tree in the right place. And if you would need a volunteer to come down to the Loire Valley to collect some oak trees, uh, I'd be volunteer. I'm first in line for that. Um, so, OK, we've got 10 minutes left for Chris Gibbard. Um, so, yeah. Hopefully, Chris, you you can uh, just jump right in. Yes, indeed. Can I just check everyone can hear me OK? Can hear you and can see your screen. Just need to pop it into the uh, presentation view. Absolutely. Yeah, OK. okay. So, Looking good. Thanks, John. Yeah, I'm Chris. I'm one of the field managers in the Southwest area team. I wanted to really uh, just talk to you a little bit about the grants and licenses surrounding uh, ash felling and ash dieback. Um, it will be a really quick run through. Um, like Chris said, it's more important to hear Ivan and Chris talk, to be honest with you. I'm, I'm conscious that you will probably all be aware uh, and be well versed in these topics, so I will keep it, I will keep it brief. Uh, so what, what I wanted to run through really is what money is out there, what grant is available to help us deal with this ash dieback problem, and that's really going to be talking about the tree health grants that we have available. Uh, I wanted to also then look at the law. So this is really talking about um, the need for felling licenses, potentially, and even potentially looking at some of the exemptions for the need for felling license, because um, sometimes that can be a little contentious. Um, and then really just to summarise how we can get where we can get more help, where, you know, where's the information, who you, can, who you can talk to about this. So the first section of the presentation is what financial help is there really? Again, I think we'll all be aware that there is the, a grant called Countryside Stewardship out there. This is grant funding for things inside and outside of woodland mainly. But what we want to focus on today is the Woodland Tree Health Grants. Um, these have been useful tools in the past to help um, mitigate the impacts of tree diseases on our woodlands and help some proactive management. These tree grants are uh, can be split into two. One is the Tree Health Improvement Grant. This isn't a focus for today's talk because that's more focused on Phytophthora at Remorum and uh, the felling of immature large crops are infected and infected rhododendron. What I really wanted to focus on was the other half of the tree health grants which is tree health restoration grant and this is for support for restocking 
woodlands after felling due to a tree health issue and crucially those tree health, tree health issues that are eligible include ash dieback um, so like i say the tree health restoration is there to provide some financial assistance to restock after felling diseased ash it's actually one of the easier countryside stewardship um, grants to apply for the minimum sort of threshold here we're looking for here is 0.25 of a hectare obviously if you reach that threshold you can go much larger uh, to do much more work under the grant scheme um, but that can be down to sort of 0.1 hectare blocks that can be made up of to help facilitate some of that smaller planting smaller group felling uh, within our plantations and woodlands the grant is fairly generous obviously depending on your site really but it's capped if you want to restock native species at £2,750 per hectare um, it, that is uh, bumped up quite a bit to 3500 if you're planting on an ancient woodland site um, if you're looking at the non-native species we're down to £2,250 per hectare cap and inevitably in ancient woodland site if you want to plant non-native species that is bumped down to £1,750 per hectare cap um, oh, apologies. The, it's, there's a range of capital items available. The basic unit of the grant is actually the supply and plant of a tree, which I think is valued at about £1.28 through the grant scheme. Um, so it's paying per tree rather than an area based uh, grant scheme, which does tend to encourage some decent stocking densities, which is nice. Um, other capital items are available on top and they're based on really protecting the restock sites. So that would be tree guards, deer fencing, um, sheep netting stop fencing uh, and associated field uh, gates and uh, things like that really just to protect restock sites and get them away things to consider uh, i've just noted a few things applications can be submitted all year round which is quite useful um, the contracts are two years in length so a little bit of thought needs to be done uh, in terms of timing when you want to apply and getting the work done within that two years felling licenses are likely to be required in order to do the, the felling works a woodland management plan isn't um, a prerequisite to entering the grant, but is desirable, really, uh, for lots of different reasons. I haven't got the time to go into, really. Um, and the grant can be used for other things like fight up for a more mature larch and where you've got areas of sweet chestnut blight, which hopefully are few and far between. So that's uh, the tree health restoration grant in a nutshell. Uh, the second half of the presentation really is looking at felling these trees and the law so focusing on felling licenses i think as an area team we often talk to a lot of customers about this dead diseased or dying uh, exemption there there isn't really an exemption for that apart from dead trees you don't need a felling license to do so but you will require a felling license even if you have diseased or dying trees and actually we're seeing an increase in felling licenses uh, for such cases as we speak. I put up there a picture of the tree felling gate permission guide which has recently been revamped and republished. That has a lot more detail about when and where you'll need a felling license including the exemptions and a lot more so please do become familiar with that. I'm sure you all already are. Um, I should note that we apply for felling license online now via the felling license online system which theoretically makes things simpler. Again I haven't got time to go into that. I think Chris was obviously talking about importance of objectives around biodiversity, resilience, tree species choice. Um, I think obviously those are going to be at the top of any forest manager or land owners objectives when looking at managing their woodland. But also at the back of our minds will be a health and safety objective. Obviously, there's a lot of information from lights of Pfizer around um, forest workers and contractors working the wooden around ash dye back. But the other side of the health and safety coin will be our thoughts on public safety particularly where we've got footpaths, other infrastructure running close to, to areas which are infected by ash dieback. This really does sort of lead on to a lot of discussions about exemptions on the failing licenses, particularly around dangerous trees, which I want to explore very, very quickly. Uh, obviously, we've got tools like the personal allowance, which is the five cubic metres allowance we're allowed to do per calendar quarter, which allows us to deal with any potential increase in risk from ash dieback um, on a small scale. But there is a dangerous tree exemption, and I would make everyone aware to be cautious of this. Obviously, we do not need a lic uh, license for dead trees, but um, they are needed 
uh, sorry, a license is not needed if the trees do actually pose a real and immediate danger. And this is what can throw people a lot of the time. So uh, the wording in the tree felling guide is an exemption applies for the felling of a tree or trees necessary for the prevention of danger. The danger exemption could be said to apply only where there is an immediate risk of serious harm and urgent work is needed to remove the risk. So I think we are aware that potentially old and or diseased trees may not potentially pose a real or immediate danger. Obviously, this can change when near paths or infrastructure and things like that. But I just wanted to highlight, if you choose to use that exemption under dangerous trees, you will need to have evidence to back up your decision in case you're challenged further down the line for using that exemption under the phone license. Things you can use to evidence a fixed point photography. Written reports can be absolutely crucial from forestry professionals or ARB professionals who can definitely identify trees with an immediate risk or real danger. Uh, our regs team are often keen to tell people that there are other tools which we can do where we've identified areas which could be higher risk due to ash by dieback, not necessarily a need to knee jerk, react and fell those trees, but there are other tools such as closing the woodland or footpaths to alleviate or reduce that risk. So really the bottom line is if you have any doubt, the recommendation is to apply for a felling license. Um, further guidance just, really. If you have photos of the trees being bad, looking bad for several years in a row, I think that is a very good evidence for problematic or of severe facial infections by, uh, of amalaria. Of Indeed, fungus. absolutely. And that's where that photography I mentioned comes in really important. And if I go back a few slides. No, it's further on, actually, which has a nice basal leaves and picture. Oh, no, maybe I did go past it. Apologies. I think there was a picture previously of a basal lesion there. But for, if you want to explore that, the need for failing license around ash, particularly around the dangerous trees issue, then please do look at Operations Note 46A, which goes into that a lot of detail. And Operations Note 46 uh, looks at the managing of ash trees in woodlands in light of ash dieback and does touch on the need for failing licenses in woodland as well. But Bottom line is, please consider applying for a felling licence. It's probable that you will need one and really go to your local woodland officer to seek more advice about really the tree health grants and also wh whether or not you potentially need a felling licence. Uh, I do have a couple more slides on, but I think I'll end it there. That's probably a, a decent summary just there because I realise we're we've hit the time limit. That's great. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for keeping to time. That's more than I can do most. Um, so yeah there we go folks um now there have been a lot of questions um in the chat but ivan's already offered to to answer those by sort of text afterwards and um and i think that is probably the best way so i don't want to take up any more of your time so we've got plenty to be getting on with so we'll we'll take the questions from the chat and i'll circulate uh text a q a for that after the event with the recording as well if you want to pass that on um so we will circulate that through the e-alert if you already received that you'll receive one um in in the near future um, if you don't i put my email address in the chat so take a copy of that um and and contact me directly and we can subscribe you to the alert so you will get the recordings you'll get the the q and a's as well um so yeah all that remains is for me to issue a massive massive thank you to our speakers um so engaging so well delivered um really uh quite positive as well that you know we ash dieback isn't quite as bad um as we've all been led to believe i know it's the first question was at about five percent resilience but it looks like our forests are actually probably a lot healthier than that. Um, the one note I would sign off with is to remind you of how dangerous felling diseased ash trees can be. Ivan mentioned it, there have been accidents in the UK um, with unexpectedly trees shattering as they hit the road, the, the base, unknown basal infections that suddenly just cause the trees to come back over you. So please, please, please be safe. Um, and on that note, uh, yeah, thank you all so, so, so much. It's been a really fantastic session. Thank you for inviting me. I'm sorry I took so much of your time. <laughs> it was well, well worth it. The comments in the chat prove how much people have enjoyed that. Um, yeah.
anytime you just tell me and you're welcome to contact me if you have any questions just send me an email and i'm happy to answer and also the ones who wanted to borrow images if they're mine to lend you can borrow them for free i don't take any money i just want them to be used some of the images in the slides were not mine so you'll just have to contact me but i'm happy to anything you can use to help you with this problem great thank you Ivan. so i'll just keep the meeting open for a little while now but yeah please everyone just uh, enjoy the rest of your day take care thanks everyone bye 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 bye, bye.